Kia ora, I'm Claire Finlayson, Programme Director of the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. The 2019 festival recording that you're about to hear was brought to you with funding from the Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature and with the support of ORFM. This session, Vincent O'Sullivan, was chaired by Fergus Barrowman. Enjoy. Uh, kia ora tato. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Fergus Barrowman. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this morning to the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival and to the session with Vincent O'Sullivan. Um, a real privilege to be up here with Vincent today. Um, I'm going to give Vincent a little introduction. Um, not that I need to, but I think we need to you know, establish the scale and range and restlessness of his writing career. Um, just so that, so I, th I think v Vincent is one of the great people in New Zealand writing, but I think he's a person that's a little bit difficult to see, um, and that's partly because of the ground he's covered. Vincent was born in 1937, grew up in Auckland, studied at Auckland and Oxford universities. He was a lecturer at Victoria and then Waikato University. Um, he was literary editor of The Listener. He was a kind of renegade um, travelling scholar in Australia for a few years. And then he came back to New Zealand and was professor of English at Victoria before his retirement. And for some years now, he has been a resident here in Dunedin. Vincent's first book, uh, Collection of Poems, was published in 1965. It was the first, I think, of 20 books, if I count correctly. It's actually hard to know what to count sometimes with the... Is that um, poetry you're talking about? Poetry collections. Yeah. Yeah. I think 20 is the number. Yeah. There are seven collections of um, short stories, three or four novels, depending on what you count. We might talk about that later, too. Um, a great range of drama, libretti, essays, criticism major editorial work of New Zealand literature and canonical works of Catherine Mansfield, and um, two major biographies, uh, The Life of John Mulgan, a very important New Zealand book, and also as yet unpublished a biography of Ralph Hotere, um, which again I'd like to get to at the end of the session if we could yes, bring it around to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, the great good fortune of starting to, getting to know Vincent professionally back in 1984, um, and it was over the publication of his play Shuriken, a really amazing play about the terrible events at the Japanese prisoner of war camp outside Featherstone. And a really important play in New Zealand literature, I think, because of what it shows about the, the narrowness and bigotry in New Zealand and the way that it can create, against everybody's best intentions, that kind of tragic outcome. And I've gone on to publish a range of Vincent's other books, most recently the novel All This By Chance, which you'll all know is one of the finalists for the Acorn Foundation Prize in Fiction, announced on Tuesday. A book that Nicholas Reed said was as outstanding a novel as has been produced in this country in the last 10 years. I think the only problem with that statement is the qualifier at the end. And um, there was a very nice short review in the ODT this morning, which simply called it a classic, which I think is true. So welcome, Vincent. Please Thank give you. Vincent a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Little blurb for the session that's in the festival program says that I'm going to ask you, how did you get to be so darned accomplished? So can I ask you that? How did you get to be so darned accomplished? Um, well, I'm not that good at fiction that I could give you a set <laughs> an answer without. The, the trouble is, or not the trouble is, the great advantage is that if you hang around long enough, people seem to think you've done more than you have. And... Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's like if a family grows and grows and you don't notice much at the time until there's too many to fit into the photograph or something. Um, so, you know, I don't... I, I take that with a grain of salt and I think mm -hmm. other people should too. Yeah. Yeah. Lo lovely um, demonstration of Kiwi modesty there, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all warm. <laughs> um, well, c can I ask you that in a, in a slightly different way? Mm. Because I've heard you talk um, about your family background, your Irish parents, mm. the, mm. I suppose the Fenian nature mm. of some of the political influences mm. in your childhood, and growing up Catholic in New Zealand, so a little bit of an outsider. There's not a lot of that directly in your fiction, but it, did that shape you? Oh, well, I suppose it inevitably... Sh uh, everyone's shaped by their early years, whether they, uh, they're too pleased about that or not. They simply are. Um, I've never used it in 
my writing for... I, I grew up in... It wasn't sort of quite a ghetto, but it was very sort of noticeably uh, and distinctly uh, Irish uh, part, part of Auckland and so on. Mm -hmm. And, for example, when I first read um, The Portrait of the Artist as uh, a teenager, I thought, how does he know so much about what it's like? <laughs> um, and this is one of the reasons I've never really written or tried to write myself about um, that uh, sort of Irish side of New Zealand, because the Irish write too well about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and if you admire someone as much as I admire Joyce or his short stories and so on, I don't know how I'd ever be free mm -hmm. of a slightly parodic uh, attempt of simply uh, an antipodean version mm -hmm. of something that is done superbly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, it's true. I suppose it has shaped me and my tastes and, and various things. But that's the reason, really, that uh, I haven't tried to write about it. Now, that can be a bit of a lame excuse. And a lot of Australian writers with Irish backgrounds especially mm. um, uh, have utilised that. Yeah. Do, do you so, think you might write about it? Do you think it's something that might... Just recently up? I wrote the first uh, what you might call Irish story mm. that I've done. But uh, the good thing about that, it's too late, so there can't be many of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> um, but just going back to that, did, did you as a, as a child and sort of Irish Catholic child mm. in Auckland feel any sense of exclusion? I'm, I'm just thinking of my own childhood mm. in the 1960s and I, I grew up in Glen Road in Kelvin, which yes. is, you know, is the epicentre of civilised Wellington. Yes, yes, yes. And yet the language I as a small child remember using about the Catholic kids yes. in my street is pretty yeah. horrifying to recall. Yes. Well, I think it's always a bit disappointing if people don't abuse you at some point. <laughs> uh, it's character forming, Fergus. Yeah. And, um, th and that probably helped, helped you sort of through a difficult time in Kelvin, as I can imagine. I, I'm sure it did, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those feelings of power, yes. yeah. <laughs> but I think, um, like anyone who's, who grows up in a, in a distinct sort of community, what, whatever, whether it's a religious one or a political one or something like that, you take it for granted. So you don't feel excluded. You're mm. not the one on the outside. Other people are. Um, and if people who are unfortunate enough, you think of families who were particularly poor or had difficulties or something, the thing I've always admired about people like that when sort of in the working class area where I grew up, they weren't defeated by it, they defied it. Mm -hmm. And I think when people, other people want to put definitions on you, it doesn't matter too much as long as you're reasonably clear and confident yeah. that you're not diminished by what the wider community mm -hmm. says. Mm -hmm. But I, I wasn't particularly aware in Auckland at any time of, uh, you know, there were people, of, we went to different schools and that sort of thing, but the people next door who went to another school we, you played with and so on. So sometimes I think it can be overstated, yeah. that sense of, you know, I never felt marginalised, but then most people I know didn't feel marginalised either. OK, well, I'll leave that there, but I might come back to that mm. a little bit later. But I want to take you forward, um, sort of skipping the poetry, mm -hmm. um, to talk about your fiction. Um, and I think you published your first novel, though it's a book I have to confess I haven't read, and not many people have, called Miracle, <laughs> at, at the young age of 39. Um, That's right. That was a, a miracle, a romance it was called. And it was just a, a short thing, a, a really a jokey piece about what was leading up to the 1981 tour. Mm -hmm. um, it did sell a few copies. I had a few aunts who bought it, that sort of thing. <laughs> and, but, but, but one of these aunts who thought mm -hmm. it was a religious book because it was called Miracle, mm -hmm. <laughs> then asked me the when I saw is. her about six months later, she said, I can't in conscience, she said, except buying that, so I think you should give me the money for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you? <laughs> so I probably did to keep it good, yes. Yes, so, uh, but I was very grateful. Publishers I've been enormously grateful mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Of course, the first was McIndoe's. Right. And Brian Turner had the, <clears throat> the, the, the kindness to publish this, and because it was about sport, I think that, uh, right, that yeah. helped me through the door. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Brian also edited uh, The Boy, The Bridge, The River, the first book yes, of short yes. stories that mm. was published, again, here in Dunedin in 1978. Yes, yes. 
Can, can you say a little bit about what that was like? And, and I think I'm getting at the importance to a, a, a young writer, an emerging writer, of finding a very good editor and also the kind of local independent publishing which can take on short stories and new voices. Yes, you could at that stage assume that if you would written a book of short stories, there was a pretty good chance of getting it published. It was much easier for short story writers then than mm-hmm. it is now. There's no doubt that it's the Cinderella of New Zealand writing. In those 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, the listener used to have a weekly story. There were magazines all over the place that, that published them. And I think you'd probably agree with this, that writers are a bit weary of taking on a first book if it's a book of short mm-hmm. stories. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a great pity because sometimes the best writing that people do is in their short stories. Did, did, did you think of those short stories as trainee pieces or were you really no, not into, into the form? No, no. Mm. Um, I was always a, a sort of a, a bit late arriving at the party <laughs> in the sense that I didn't write a novel until I was in in my 50s and so mm-hmm. I just didn't have the confidence uh, or uh, before then mm-hmm. um, to have a go and uh, I just like writing stories for their own sake. I wasn't interested, I didn't for a minute think, you know, I'm running a hundred yards training for a marathon. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on the short stories, um, partly because I've been reading them recently. We're working on a new selected stories to publish later this year which with the help of Stephen Stratford as his editor, we've now got down to 35 indispensable stories, a book of about 600 pages. Absolutely magnificent achievement. Um, and I just picked up this description of your themes that um, Mac Jackson must oh, have had yes. great fun yeah. writing for the Companion of New Zealand Literature. Do you, do you remember this? Deprivation, betrayal, rejection, sadness, deceit, estrangement and loss, death is a recurring theme. Oh, there were a few laughs there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that strikes me as a wonderful summary of almost every young writer's That's, abiding theme. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose, to be frank about it, I think it's almost impossible to have an optimistic view of life. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that in a, in a glib way, but, for example, one of my favourite lines of poetry of the 20th century is Bertolt Brecht, a marvellous line of his when he says, the smiling man has not yet heard the news. <laughs> and it's very difficult to look at, you know, the history mm-hmm. of our lifetime or any of our lifetimes and think, well, that was one's own life, may have been very satisfactory individually during that time, but nobody would say, gosh, I was lucky enough to live through really marvellous happy times of human mm. progress. And yeah. um, so I don't think, I think it's possible to write about, well, at least I hope it's possible mm. to write about those things that Mac mentions mm. without gloom. Right. Gloom is the killer, mm-hmm. I think, for a writer. Mm. Um, so, you know, you can write about a family being burned, burned, you know, or something like that, and as long as you... Uh, Smile about it, it's not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure Mac wrote that with a smile. <laughs> yes. um, and, and there's a line from All This By Chance towards the end when Stephen, the central character, is reflecting. He says, all this, in spite of everything, glad. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's a book which has a great deal of hardship and sorrow in it, mm. but also a great deal of love, sex, yes. joy, jokes. Yes. I think that even people you know uh, who've had difficult lives compared with one's own and so on, I don't think I've ever met anyone, you know, unless they've had the bad luck to have some hideous misfortune like a a disease when they're young or something, who doesn't towards the end think, well, it was better to have Mm -hmm. had that life than have had none. Right. And so I think we're constantly fighting Mm. against the evidence. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Going, going back to the short stories again and just the, the way in which those seem to me to mm. pack in those mm. themes which you then deal with more elaborately later. There's that amazing novella, The Boy, the Bridge and the River, probably 70 pages. So I'm sure today in, in mm. our more sort of lavish publishing world we would publish it between covers as a mm. whole book and sort of feather out the leading and turn it into a short novel. But that has a character, Lattie, who has survived terrible events in the Second World War in Eastern Europe, which are detailed 
and given in great moving detail according to his personal experience and his love for his nephew, but never really mm. recounted mm. in political terms. Yes. And then you land him in, in the Waikato, in, yes. in a lovely, serene, rural situation. Well, usually I don't <coughs> have people I know uh, in stories, although I take situations mm -hmm. that I've known, but with that character, I, I flattered in, in London in the 60s with a, a Latvian man who was simply known as Latty, who had been, of course, like Lat many Latvians, obliged to be in the German army through the war. And so I suppose here's what set me off. And yeah. I thought, what would have happened to him had he gone to New Zealand? Yeah. Whereas, in fact, I mean, if you want a, a, an utterly bizarre and tragic note, this mm -hmm. man who'd fought in Russia and God knows all these things mm -hmm. in the war, he actually died. He had. He was a very lonely sort of mm. man, and his great love was a canary, mm -hmm. and he caught a lung disease from the canary that killed him. Right. But I've never used that story because it is, is too appalling, just too Oops. sad, and you've got no right to take someone's mm. distress to that extent, mm. well, I think, and make yeah. entertainment out of it. No, well, that's the private tragedy, but Isn't it? You, yes. you can create a parallel for that, yes, yes. As, as you have in the story. Mm. I mean, just, just to change the subject slightly, you, you still have never learned to drive, have you? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never pressed myself too hard to think of a reason why. Um, I'm, I'm sure it shows some deep psychological flaw that I'm better not knowing about. I, I'm, but, I'm, I'm interested, and <laughs> interested in this, and I'm yeah. sort of imagining an anthology of the great non-drivers of New Zealand literature with you <laughs> and, and Steve Braunius and yeah. Ashley Young and, and, and Kevin and, Ireland and, 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 and a few others. Yes, and, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if that particular character... Well, if I wanted to be literary about it, which I don't, but I remember Henry James, of course, who couldn't drive, naturally, mm -hmm. and said, of course, the great advantage we have over others, mm -hmm. I mean, just passengers, yeah. is that we gather sensations by the handful, <laughs> by, you know, having other people do the work. By looking out the window. It. Exactly. Yes, it yeah. seems a bit highfalutin, doesn't it? But, uh, I think there's a truth in it. Yeah. yeah. I did, my brother did try to teach me to yeah. tell the truth, but I was a, a slightly dyslexic as a, as a, a child oh, and yeah. um, had trouble sort of left and right. So I'm mm -hmm. starting to get close to the answer <laughs> now. And that may have had something to do with it, but I always felt very nervous of yeah. and trying to, yeah. That, that reminds me of navigating while Elizabeth's driving. Yes. Turn left. No, no, your other left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but to, to go back to the boy at the bridge of the river, um, in, in that story, you contrast Latty and his gentle friend Len yes. with um, a, a boss character called Dryland, um, yes. you know, a, a sort of a hypocritical, hard-driving, yes. successful yes. middle New Zealander. Yes. And in the other story, Grove, when you have the, the sad, slightly damaged musician with a past that's never revealed called Grove, mm. And he's contrasted with McCafferty, the, the boss's daughter, who's another of these yes. characters. And I, I've come to think of these characters as the drivers in your fiction. <laughs> so the drivers are always the baddies. They're, they're yeah. the Rotarians and the mayors and uh, the businessmen. Dear, oh dear. Um, and, and we want to stand with the non-drivers, don't we? No, that's never occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I think... I'm, I'm too dependent on friends ever to admit to that. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the great things about Latty in, in The Boy, The Bridge, The River is the way that he's like a, a Martian in New Zealand. He can have yes. a slightly outsider perspective. And I just noted... Well, down yes, that was set in... I spent nine years living in the Waikato. We don't think of New Zealand as having the distinctive regions that, say, places in the UK do mm -hmm. and so on. But I think we... I mean, it seems to me a Taranaki state of mind is quite different from a, a Waikato one right. and, or, or an Otago one or something like that. Um, and that it was very easy to meet people like mm -hmm. the, these villainous people yep. in, the, in the Waikato. And where I lived in, in, in Cambridge, mm -hmm. of course, you were surrounded by the horse people and yeah. so on. And on the one hand, there was the extreme interest of, you know, I was interested in, in horses and, and, and yeah. jockeys, mm -hmm. and the jockeys are incre incredibly fascinating. You followed the but, races? No, I followed the, 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 sort of the situation of, right, yeah. of, 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 of uh, racing more, and they were the closest 
in a, in a way, to a, a peasant group mm -hmm. because they were boys who... Um, well, I knew some teachers at the local school. They had to go to school. But some of these kids, 13 and 14, training to be jockeys, of course, they were asleep yeah. by playtime because they'd been up riding at four. Mm. It was, it's a heck of a difficult and, and, life. And almost malnourished. Though. Malnourished yeah. and incredibly sort of the fights they'd have and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And on the other hand, um, of course, some, some of the great names of racing like Hogan and so on. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not saying this man particularly, but um, we're, we're like these... They were, they were the lords of the area. Mm. That th they had a, a social dominance, not yeah. just in racing, but they were very rich. And um, there was an American had a farm next to where, where I was living. And I won't say what he was known lo locally as, but his name was Hunk, Bunker Hunt, so you can guess what <laughs> yeah. he was called. And, and, um, and it was an extraordinary sort of yeah. non-New Zealandness about it, and mm. yet it was purely in New Zealand terms. Right, yeah. Yeah. So those villains of... I suppose it, it comes down to, you, you get them everywhere, sort of social bullies. Yeah. And who are the, 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 the detestable people. Yeah, and they're yeah. connected with power and money. That's right. So I suppose if someone had me on once by saying, look, everything you write is really just a, 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 a sort of a lolly wrapped socialism. <laughs> um, and sort of, I can, can see the point of that. But. Uh, Very sound position to But take, I'm glad it is, yes. Yeah. 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 And one of the things that Latty observes is that New Zealand has no one space where young and old might come together for food or talk or singing or grief. Yes. And is that part of your perception of what New Zealand was like then? Or I think so. And I think, if, I think it's a bad thing always to make, uh, I mean, to make comparisons, easy comparisons between New Zealand and other countries, and there's all sorts of reasons for it. But... Um, one of the things, even as a child, I quite envied Maori for was their a sense of community, mm -hmm. which most of us didn't have. I mean, I think of the street I lived in, the street probably most of us lived in. Um, you knew all the people along the road yeah. and, and, and so on, although these were the days when I was a boy. Uh, men called each other by their first names, but women were always Mrs. Edwards, Mrs. Yeah. Smith, or something like that. And there was that intense sense of reservation and privacy, mm -hmm. which I think now is a kind of shyness too. Yeah. Um, but it was that complete absence of, and so it would come out in sentimental ways like pipe bands or mm. Irish jig clubs or things like this. Mm. And there's no, nothing wrong mm. with that, but it was as if we didn't have our own yeah. coherence. It becomes and, a sort and, of singular and slightly yeah. coercive But the trouble is if belonging. you start thinking that too much, there's almost a, a condescension comes into it, and that, that to me is the most unforgivable sin of all, socially or politically or personally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I've often thought what New Zealand needed most in writing was a Jane Austen. Someone who could have a, an eye for the absolute minute gradations that you get in, in society. Right. And you get it in Auckland, in a vulgar sense, mm -hmm. don't you, you know, and sort of rich housewives and all that sort of thing. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a thing that we come to, we approach particularly in writing. No, we're not good at looking at that, are we? Yeah, we like yeah. to... Well, it goes against what we want New Zealand to be mm. and what, quite rightly, some of our ideals are. <laughs> but when, you know, the former Prime Minister, or rather when Helen Clark was so keen on getting an image of our nationalism, which would encompass good things. You just can't do that. Mm. You can't make up <coughs> a programme. No, it, it, it's, it's all very well to, <coughs> to, to celebrate the gentleness of New Zealand, yes. and you get Latty and his friend Len, but then that pro creates the situations where the bigotry that, that dry land yes. sort of comes out with has tragic consequences. Yes. and. And I mean, what I love in that story is the way that it's both Latty's suppressed and untended <coughs> memories of the trauma and the bigotry he mm. suffers that, you know, create the climax. And I think that brings us forward to... But we're not alone in this, are we? I, mean, yeah. every, I wouldn't for a minute to say, oh, well, we've got our undue sh share of bullies and so on. Mm. You read, you know, in, in my view, the greatest 
or at least my favourite um, 20th century writer is Faulkner. Mm -hmm. And if ever there was a man who absolutely loved his community and yet had the eye for every human disagreeable <laughs> yes. folly. Um, so you, you don't want to... You've got to keep that balance between <coughs> presenting this as an unattractive part of it, yeah. but always something a bit bigger, which is a, sort of saving us from being the pits. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, it seems to me that one of the changes in the novel, All This By Chance, mm. is that you're a little bit, can I say this, a bit kinder about some of those aspects. Yeah, you can be quite them. hurtful, you know, <laughs> at times. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Yes, that reminds me. Uh, perhaps it's, it's, it's a folly of age, but the last time I saw Dan Davin, who was, uh, uh, he said, you know, the worst thing about this getting old business, he said, it isn't the bits that don't work and so on, he said, but you start to like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, specific, specific. And there's, there's a moral there. <laughs> <laughs> well, specifically in All This By Chance, there yes. are the two characters in the middle of the book, um, the son, David, yes. and his sister's yeah. partner, Fergus, yes. um, who I think might have been the, the baddies in earlier work, yeah. but now you see them as... Um, failures and, yes. and people that you have a lot more compassion mm, with. Mm. Or in common with, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so all, all this by chance is an, an astonishingly rich and wonderful novel and I don't know whether we need to avoid spoilers on the grounds that everybody here has read it or whether we can just dive into talking about what happens. But, but very briefly, it's a novel in which two people meet in London in 1947, a refugee from Germany and a young New Zealand pharmacy student, and it follows forward through their family until their granddaughter goes back to Wroclaw in yes. what, what's now Poland, I yes, think. Yes, it was Breslau when it yeah, was yeah. And then a, a sort of a flashback to 1938 and her great-grandmother's mm. journey from Breslau to Berlin to connect with her sister. Um, and it seems to me that you're putting so much into that book because you've brought the destruction of Europe and the Holocaust into New Zealand in Eva's memories, but you've also, through Stephen and through the younger members of the family, shown New Zealanders journeying back out to the world and trying to mm. you know, deal with the world's atrocities. Well, you can't avoid them. Yeah. I think uh, the difficulty in, in writing that book, uh, I don't mean the, the business of writing, but <clears throat> whether I should have been writing it at all <clears throat> in the sense that, you know, sometimes I get a bit tired of the political correctness of saying you shouldn't write about this group, you shouldn't write about that, you know, because you weren't <clears throat> uh, mm. born in Iceland, you shouldn't have an Icelandic character or something like that. But Anything to do with the Holocaust is enormously difficult. Mm. Um, and it's, it's not our story, or not my story. To what extent have I got to come in? And it, there have been such superb writing about the Holocaust in fiction and in fact. And, but I needed it for this story because, although it might sound a bit glib, but um, I think as long as there's one Jew in New Zealand, the Holocaust, in some way, is a New Zealand story. Mm. And so I'm dealing with this Jewish family who weren't practicing, uh, practicing Jewish or something, but nobody, Jewish or otherwise, can escape from what, to me, is, was the defining event almost of human history. Everything about the way we regard mm. <coughs> humanity, I think, yeah. changed in some way. Um, mm. And so... I was interested to just take this story that wasn't a New Zealand story and yet see how it affected New Zealand. And so just one thing I, I will say about is that there's one scene, um, there's only one short section which is set in, in the uh, women's camp at, at Ravensbrook. And that was the one, naturally, that you, you don't want to sound as if, you know, I hate these movies where we see Germans and they're nice uniforms and all that sort of thing, and this is pretending to tell you something about the war. Um, and so I had to get away, uh, away round mm. 
not presuming to say anything about Jews that was from an outsider's, total outsider's point of view, and yet here I was as a total outsider. But at Ravensbrook, an interesting thing about that camp, which was the entirely women's camp, is that the most respected group there, most respected by the Jewish women, the Poles, everyone, were the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. And I'd always thought of Jehovah's Witnesses, well, I knew nothing about them, as most of us don't. And I read a bit about them and in connection with this and finished up with an enormous admiration for them. They were the only people in the camps who were voluntary is that a Jehovah's Witness could walk out of a camp any day they liked if they signed a declaration saying that they wouldn't say Hitler was anti-Christ. And not one woman out of 1,200 left Ravensbrook. And they were people of enormous integrity and so on. And so I was able to tell that chapter, because one of my main characters is a Jehovah's Witness woman who had been in Germany um, where for family reasons, um, and she tells the story of when she and the other character were in the camp. So it's not presuming at all to say, here's a Jewish character and what I thought. You know, I had to sort of get off the hook of, of the risk of doing that. And so uh, that explains why. Luckily, a very fortunate thing is that, you know, it was quite legitimate. Now you can say, well, what right did I have to pretend to know what a Jehovah's Witness is like? But How did you find Miss McGovern? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But there, it, it could be done without being mm. risking the same sort of offence. Yeah. Well, one of the lovely things about the novel is the way that these stories are filtered through several tellings and several knowledges. Mm. Um, and I know that we've used the word secrets on the back cover mm. because that's the word you have to use yes. to sort of make a plot sound sexy. Yes. Um, but in fact, there's a lovely line from Stephen um, in the book as well where he says, um, not speaking of something is not at all the same thing as to conceal. Mm. And that seems to me in a way the, the mm. deeper moral of that part of the book. Mm. That wasn't a question, was it? <laughs> no, no, but it's an observation that I think, yes, that was the... Yeah. I suppose the an interesting challenge in, in, in writing it was to mm. tell a story that each character, because it's a generational thing, so the further you go, the further away mm. from mm. the original events back in, 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 in Germany in the 30s, and, mm. but oddly enough, the further away you get, the more intense the interest is mm. in the people who have that distance from it. Yes, and you have yeah. the contrast between yeah. David, who stays in New Zealand, That's right, and yes. is desperate to kind of and claim... And is a hard-line Zionist. And so, claims yeah. an authentic identity, which he is yes. ever anxious about. Yes. And then his sister Lisa, mm. um, without giving too much away, who goes off as a doctor to, to Africa, mm. and then becomes involved in mm. contemporary people smuggling with, with mm. tragic results. Mm. And, and by connecting the Holocaust with the people smuggling, you're then sort of, I think, giving a signal forward to the contemporary refugee crisis. Yes, yeah. yes. That there's always someone who is beyond the margins that we have to deal with in unpleasant ways, you know. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. quite, quite a moral task for fiction, isn't yes, it? It yes. has to be open mm. to these realities. Mm. Yeah. My only reservation, Fergus, if I might say so, about this beautifully produced as a, as a piece, so thank you, you know, as, as a publisher, is using the word Holocaust because mm. it's not a holo you know, a Holocaust fiction should only be written by people who, you know, right, yes. and otherwise it's a bit of a label that you're not entitled to you. So, but you you obviously can't say here's a novel that. The author says the characters have connections with the Holocaust, but it's not a Holocaust novel. <laughs> you, you can't say that, you but can, you see my reservation. You, you about can only it. have yep. so many yes. kind of provisos in a blue, yes. which has to be 200 words and, yes. and yes. get people to open their wallets. Exactly. Um, one of the other things that happens in the book is that all of the characters go on journeys. You know, Stephen's first journey mm. to study pharmacy actually get, brings back mm. either his wife and mm. starts. Uh, mm the whole happy but shaded side mm. of the story. Everyone else goes on a journey, but no one ever gets quite what they want. 
I mean, uh, what are you drawing on for that? Life. <laughs> <laughs> um, they all, in a way, have lives that are satisfactory mm -hmm. to some extent, but there is, is disappointment yeah. with them. But I don't, I, at least I hope that's not overdone. It's not a, a sense of saying, ha ha, it doesn't matter how much you hope, you're not going to get what yeah. you want. Yeah. It just happens to be a fact of, you know. Yeah. Can, can, can we have a short reading um, from Esther visiting Wroclaw at okay. the end of the book? Yeah. This is a bit when the, the granddaughter, Stephen the pharmacist, meets this girl in London just after the war. And she's one of the children who had um, been brought from Germany to England in the 30s um, and was brought up by and brought up sort of with great kindness and so on by a Quaker family. And so the fact that she has originally a Jewish background in Germany means absolutely nothing to her. And it's only, you know, by, by chance that she's drawn back into uh, a family situation. Now, this, this section um, is when the granddaughter of uh, who's uh, this uh, New Zealand girl is drawn to go back. Her father, the Zionist, who had become sort of very serious practicing Jewish um, man, was never really had the courage to go to Israel or to go mm. back. He was always talking about it. And the girl who doesn't share that belief is the one who's driven to try and find out um, more. You had the reference there, didn't oh, you? 303, I think. Okay. Or 304. And she goes back to uh, try and find out something about what it was like in Breslau, now Roslav. Um, and she walks around and nothing much happens. And she realises there's a point at which you can't recover the past, but the fact that you can't recover it makes the past all the more intense. And she goes to, um, she goes to a, a synagogue, it's a, a real synagogue called the White Stork, um, as she's walking around the town. And she knows about her, the, the, uh, her great uncles and, and so on who, who, who finished up in, in, in camps and died there. And, but this is a, a New Zealand girl with more curiosity than fact to go on. And it's the endless story of trying to find out about the past. And the White Stork, that oddest of names for a synagogue, a long time back the name of a drinking house that stood there first, so there is no surprise in that. A pub, a place to stay, nothing to do with them, until the families of whom are her own must have been, been once, and were rich enough to buy the land, to build in a style that showed their wealth, their education, their being like anyone else apart from this, apart from their wanting their God to have a place that no one would doubt belonged to them, to decorate it with fine galleries, with the white and gold patterns and designs and elegance that made it worthy of him and themselves worthy of it. This was the 19th century. This was Germany. The people she came from were part of what sustained the fineness of both. This was not a place where peasants, where mutterers in Yiddish or local dialects came to declare dissent, but an educated people were proud to be seen. She had heard as much for years from David, that's her father, <clears throat> and now she saw why his version was another world. But the building is a shell of what it may have been, expanses of raw, distempered walls as she enters its big spaces, the derelict rooms where workmen seem in the process of attempting to bring them back from their general sense of neglect, loss, decay. The rough concrete tubs, the tangle of pipes as she walks down to the female baths. Back on ground level, she makes out the dim high gallery where the women would have sat, the glaring emptiness of the windows whose patterned glass they would have faced. But the stairs she might take up to it are closed off with wooden barriers. The dull reality that this is what the past must first journey through before it is retrieved. And her accepting too, as she reads, a summary account of where she stands 
the further scouring disappointment that her family, those at least that she knows the names for, would not have attended services here in any case, but have gone to the larger reformed synagogue streets away, so grand and handsome, so certain and established, but destroyed the night of the other fires across the country they were part of. Yet to say so much as was is surely to say it in the present. The past is here or not at all. She walks out again into the open air, to the walls rising on three sides of her, the lift of the synagogue across from where she stands. It no longer bothers her, the confusion of one imagined building in mind, the reality of another in front of her. Her accepting, she thinks, that this is what must define me. The mess of it all is what I am. To be here now in the square of the courtyard that struck her is so like the bottom of a well, rising several stories to that other square of now sharp blue sky, where they had been instructed to assemble those who in absurd optimism and in incomprehension still remained in the city to be rounded up. She looks at the overlap of one cobblestone against another, the window ledges exactly as they must have seen them, the rise of the flat pillars against the painted wall. They, the family, their hands holding, touching, comforting, she supposes, or perhaps not. She had read how the older ones at times like this, the devout, the ones with certainty of more than fear, already would be moving their lips, speaking the words louder even than that, and the guards amused at their presumption, the joke that prayer might slow so much as a child's shuffle on a march that would soon begin to the rail yards and the station. Once the timetables were set in stone, and Esther's own lips move as she says the names, these are her ancestors, Chaim, Elizabeth, Sarah, Hannah, Ephraim, Saul. She closes her eyes, leans her head back against the wall. She says them over again. There is nothing more she can do. This is the closest she will be with them. That, that's a wonderfully moving passage. And, uh, uh, remarkable conclusion to, to the book, but then it goes even further. Mm. And you go back to Esther's great-grandmother going to see her sister. Yes. A different kind of journey which has both meeting and yes, yeah. you know, disappointment. So, in fact, she does visit the, you know, the family home, which is derelict and, and so mm. on. Mm. So it's, but the thing is that the more she finds, Esther, the young girl, the, the more she finds, in a sense, the more disappointed she is. Mm. That... Uh, and yet the more disappointed she realises this is the sum of what the past is. Mm. So the more I gather, the less satisfactory it's going to be, in yeah. other words. Yeah. She, she's a wholly admirable character, yes, Esther, isn't yes, she? We, yeah. we end up loving her. Yeah. yeah. But I must say that set against these is a couple of... Uh, it was entirely, uh, certainly by chance, that my villain is called Fergus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's such a letdown for <laughs> Yeah. And, um, well, a sort of villain, but uh, a sort of a, a, sort of a, a New Zealander, a, a young Irish New Zealander and his, his girlfriend who believes that she cuts a swathe through Itali mm. Italian men and so on. Um, and that was a, a way of dealing with a, an, another feeling I sometimes mm. have, that other approach to history in Europe and so on that certainly when, when I was younger, a lot of New Zealanders had, and I can't speak for them now, but that was that everything except ourselves was spectacle. Mm, mm. It was just there to entertain us. And I think a lot of people, have, a lot of us have had that experience. Like, you know, when you first go to America, you think you're on a movie set mm. because everything looks like America. <laughs> it, 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 it's mm. that sort of thing mm. and uh, so these these two in various ways sort of mm. and they behave very badly yes. but I hope they're sort of amusing um, they're amusing and, and relatable too I and, mean, and relatable because, there, yeah. because they are us after all yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so there is a balance in case you think that it's all, <laughs> all doom and gloom it's absolutely not quite not. Yeah. Okay. C can we um, now change the subject and move on to Ralph Hotteray. Yes. 
um, because oh. we said we would. And I'd, I'd love you to tell me um, how that biography project came about. Well, I'm glad to have the chance of saying something about that now, because several times a year, I suppose, I'm asked by someone, well, how's the Hutteri biography going? Well, it's not going, mm -hmm. and it was deliberately sabotaged. And it's good to have the chance of saying so, so that there's no doubt in people's mm. minds what happened. And it began, originally Ralph thought of um, asking uh, Michael King, right. which would have been a very good yeah. choice. But then very soon after that, Michael died. Mm. And I think about 19, uh, rather 2003, um, I got this message that uh, if I was down here to go and talk to Ralph, and I'd known him in the 60s when we were both students in, in England. And um, so I said yes, of course, I was mm -hmm. very interested, in, and it was just after I'd done the Mulligan biography, and you know, it, it seemed an extremely exciting possibility. And the great problem it turned out to be, although because we, were, we weren't we so close as friends, it was going to be in any way a problem. But because we were friends, we didn't think of signed contracts and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yes. I said I'd do it, and he said, use anything you like, you can say anything you like, you know, you don't have to run it past me. So it was really the ideal situation for a biography, mm. being able to work with the, uh, the subject and so that's how it set off. And it went well for a few years. By this time, Ralph had had a stroke and was, uh, you know, quite seriously ill. But then it became more and more difficult because mm. although Ralph had said, you know, do what you like with it, you have complete permission to use any, any images you want, the Hotary Trust started to prove um, a bit of a problem. Mm. And in other words, what Ralph wanted was countermanded by the trust. When I say it's a, and I want to make this very clearly to, uh, clear too, the Hotary Trust had nothing to do with the Hotary Maori family. That they could, Ralph Fanau could not have been more helpful. And one of the good things about it, even though it came mm. to nothing, was getting to know them, getting to know Mitimiti and so on. It was a real, real privilege. And although their interest in art was extremely limited, their interest in Ralph was profound. Right. Just those of you <laughs> who know Ralph's early paintings are very dark ones. Um, for example, this, this is a, a typical thing. Um, Ralph told me that an old aunt of his went up to Auckland to see his first exhibition at Barry Letts and he met her as she was coming down the stairs and she said this must be the wrong place she said there's nothing up there except a lot of dirty old blackboards <laughs> 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 and um, but the whole Maori background of, of, of Ralph was so intensely interesting but at the same time as he was insistent he would say I'm a I'm an artist and a Maori, but I'm not a Maori artist. Mm. And because I remember I said to him, wouldn't you get, be better to get a Maori writer to do this? He said, no. He said, I'm asking you because you're not. He said, because I don't want people with an agenda doing it. He was very frank mm. about that. And you can see why, you know, that I'm sure yeah. there are a number of Maori writers yeah. who would have done it very well. Yeah. But he wasn't going to take that risk. He didn't want to be used, he wanted to be regarded as an artist, yep. primarily, and then talk as much as you like about his background, mm -hmm. but always as an artist yeah. first. Yeah. You know, it was like Graham Greene used to say, I'm, I'm a Catholic and a novelist, but I'm not a Catholic novelist, etc. Mm. Yeah. that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, just it became more and more sort of difficult, and it was to, the book was to be published by Tapapa, and I'd done quite a lot of it. And then I'm... I'm trying to avoid names here, but um, being done in, I hope some of you might guess them. Um, <laughs> and the, the trust really became obstructive, and something that should have been completely open mm. 
like Ralph saying, use anything. The trust said, ah, now, Ralph isn't well. He can't look after himself. We make decisions on his part. And it got to the point that Ralph wasn't even allowed to sign. There's a book about how he came out. He wasn't allowed to sign his name in it because the trust said he is not to sign his name under any circumstances without the trust's permission. So it became... But on the other hand, he was extraordinarily well looked after by, um, by his then wife and so on. So it's not really a story of villains. Well, there is one villain, but anyway. Um, but generally it was one of sort of misunderstanding, but the worst thing is if Ralph and I had, had the sense to have all this written out what we'd yeah. agreed to. And then, of course, he was in the hospital for... And I found it more and more difficult to be allowed mm. to see him. And, you know, you can't proceed with a thing like that. So after writing quite a lot of the... Uh, the book, and then two years delay, even getting answers to letters and so on. Um, I, I, I had to th throw it in. So. Well, so, I mean, can I ask what what was the trust trying to achieve? The thing was that they would not give. I had to have their permission mm -hmm. to use images, whatever Ralph had said, yeah. and of course you can't proceed with a book about an artist. So, and the fact that it was being published by Tapapa, the most re reputable, mm. uh, you know, arts press in the country. Mm. So you can see why this became rather yeah. difficult. So uh, I'm glad you did ask me about that because otherwise it, you yeah. know, people think, well, what, what on earth did happen well, to well, this? Was it just about money? I mean... Oh, no, it wasn't was... money. No, 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 no was... one was... Money didn't come into it. It was... So why, why the block? What, what were they trying to achieve? I, well, there's that's something the in this story I completely fail to understand. Yes, I do too, and that's why someone should write a novel about it. <laughs> 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 well, we, we, we were speaking, we, we've just been speaking about contracts, and, and, yeah. and one thing I've learned in publishing is that, yeah. you know, when you think you don't need a contract is when you really might. <laughs> yes, so yes, I'll, I'll yeah. send you a contract for that novel when I, <laughs> when I get back to my desk. Um, but, but is it really true that the book absolutely needs the images? Can you not oh, totally. reimagine it as a book in which your words um, no. summon the work? No, you can't. You can't. It's, I mean, someone wrote a, a good book about T.S. Eliot and, and, with a, and couldn't get permission to quote the poetry. And I, I thought, well, that's a pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yes. it's, it's even, even more bizarre if you think of an artist. Mm. You can't talk about an artist and say, here's an image from 1960, compare it with something yeah. later, because it's the same motif or something. It becomes impossible. Yeah. And so the whole thing, communications, everything broke down. So to finish on an accurate note, I wasn't forbidden to go on with it, mm -hmm. but it was just pointless yeah. going on with it. Yeah. No. So... Uh, it's, a, it's a tragic story. But it's, I mean, it's, 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 it, well, the, the sad thing about yeah. it is something that Ralph wanted, mm. and was the easiest man to sort of mm. get on with. One of the nice things about this, it is worth mentioning, <coughs> I must have interviewed, oh, maybe 60 friends or something of Ralph, and the, there was only one person who had anything bad to say about Ralph, and that was somebody who'd stolen pictures from him, <laughs> a, a dealer. But otherwise, it's extraordinary. As any biographer will tell you, like Phil's, mm. you know, interesting, uh, mm. extremely interesting talk the other day about his Shadwell bi biography. There are always people anxious to tell you negative stories about mm. someone, or oh yes, they look good in this way, but there's the others. But with Hotry, it, w it was extraordinary the affection mm. of everyone for him, mm. and. Yeah. And the, the, the trust they had in him. Um, and yet he was on the verge of being a lovable rogue. <laughs> and when I say rogue, mm. I'm, I mean simply the sort of thing I, I loved about, and it was nice being able to write about things like this, is that he had a, a show in Auckland and he had some rich patrons. Mm. And this rich patron said, I'd give anything for that picture. And he said, would you give me your white Jaguar? <laughs> and this fellow was cornered and said, oh, all right then. <laughs> and so for years, 
Ralph drove around in this Jaguar. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we, we want those stories. I, I really <laughs> hope that the situation... <laughs> yeah, yeah unblocks and yeah. you get to complete that book because <laughs> so, I mean I think selfishly I, we, I, we I, want I, it. But the, yeah. the, 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 at least the good side of it is that um, this will all be left and the, the stuff is in the internal library and in 10 or 20 years when all this is blown over um, mm. someone's perfectly welcome mm. to, to, to use that stuff. The important thing is that the material isn't lost right, yeah. and it'll be there for mm. someone to take up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, we're almost out of time but um, we have a microphone, so if someone has been sitting on a question, um, please wave so that we can see you. I'm sure someone has something that they want to ask at this point. Hi, Vincent. Can you tell us about your very first book of poems? It's very hard to find, I understand. I haven't oh, got a copy. This is a very loaded question from <laughs> someone who, who's interested in collecting. Well, um, I should have said at the beginning when you said mm -hmm. something like 20 books of poetry, I should have corrected you immediately, he said 19. <laughs> um, because when I was working as a teacher in that, I could never really admit to this because it's such a shameful. And with Mary Ronnie there, I'm actually ashamed to say it now in front of <laughs> someone who was a librarian. But I detested my first book so much, as lots of people do with their first books, mm -hmm. and you think, what sort of vanity, you know, drove me to put, you know, abuse the public to this extent and so on. <laughs> and I had... I had a student in, in the 80s, um, it was a, 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 a very nice young woman, but a, a sort of, she wasn't particularly troubled by certain moral questions. And <laughs> what, I, what I mean by this, she said, you know, she was really broke and couldn't pay rent. So I said, well, look, every copy of this book you can get me, I'll give you five dollars for it, or five pounds. <laughs> so she and I never asked where they came from. <laughs> but you'd be very lucky to find one in a library. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's too late now to be arrested for something like that. <laughs> Sorry, do we have someone else? Were you ever drawn to the Jewish faith yourself? No, I'm extremely interested in it. I think, it, you know, a marvellously fascinating thing, but no, I wasn't, wasn't drawn to it in that sense, you know. I suppose if I had an ideal in another world of what the perfect nationality, and if someone said, what would you like to be if you had the choice of everything? I'd say an Italian Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty attractive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vincent. Yeah. You talk about all the imaginative stuff, and this whole session has been on your imagination. But I remember you being very concerned about Catherine Mansfield and the documents that we held. Ah, yes. And went to Cambridge. And this is a lovely story of Vincent coming charging into my office and said, it's gone to Cambridge and it's all wrong. <laughs> and we had to get it back. And that was quite right. Yes. And I well remember that. <laughs> But I wasn't doing anything wrong saying that. <laughs> Understand the attraction of Ralph Hoshri. Could you just explain to us the um, over here? Oh, just sorry. Explain yeah. to us the attraction of John Mulgan for you. Well, Mulgan, I would say, is my favourite New Zealander in the sense he's the one I admire most for many, many reasons. Um, I like everything, well, almost everything that I I know about him. He was probably the most unassuming, at, yet at the same time most confident young New Zealander I've ever heard of who went off to Britain to study. He was an excellent academic at what he did. Um, he was very keen on boxing, which is never to be underestimated. Um, and then anything he touched, he did extremely well. And But at the same time, he was perhaps something of a maverick, and he was very lucky, I think, to escape court-martialing because he, he just didn't like the way the British Army was run, and lots of people didn't, but you don't go and tell generals and this sort of thing, and Mulgan did, got, got offside, and that's when he joined the special operations. He was excellent at that. He was got on extraordinarily well with the Greeks, both the partisans and the Royalists. Um, he was an excellent soldier. Um, I think report on experience, it would be my f favourite bit of New Zealand prose. And then, of course, there's 
Uh, it's, it's not a great book, of course, but A Man Alone is a massively important book to New Zealanders. And so just about everything I know about him, I admire, and yet there was this other dark side to him. And I suspect now um, he'd have, they didn't even have the words for it, but you know he'd have been diagnosed as bipolar in some way. That people who met him were constantly charmed, men as much as women were always falling for him. He had great charm and integrity, but would go into sort of incredibly gloomy depressions and so on. And then just before he killed himself, he'd had malaria. The treatment for malaria at that time was itself a depressant. So there, there are all sorts of complexities surrounding him. But uh, no, he's a man that I find endlessly fascinating. Thank you, Vincent. I'm, I've, I've found this hour, which I've spent with one of my most admired New Zealanders, endlessly fascinating. <laughs> so thank you for your, your, you. your yeah. open answers and for being so interesting. Thank you all for coming along and participating today. Um, please join me in thanking Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival recording was brought to you with funding from the Dunedin UNESCO City of Literature and with the support of ORFM. The festival receives help from many corners, but we'd like to give special thanks to our major funders, Creative New Zealand, the Dunedin City Council, the Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation. <laughs>